Greetings friends of Dina Rose Ministries. If you are interested in having Dina come and speak at any of your church or organizational events, please contact us at srose at dinarose.com. If you want to turn with me in your Bibles this morning to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. We're going to start right there at verse number 15. Stand with me for the reading of God's word. 1 John 2 and 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. God, we thank you so much for the reading of your word today. Open our ears of understanding and teach us what you long for us to know in Jesus' name. You guys may be seated. I'm going to read that to you again, this time from the New Living Translation. Steve will have that up on the screen for you for those of you that don't have a New Living Translation Bible. But this is how it says it in just a little bit different wording. It says, do not love this world, nor the things that it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. It's not even possible to love both. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but they are from this world. And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. We're continuing on with Dad's series called Free Indeed. And the name of today's message is called Fighting for Your Life. We are in the fight of a lifetime. The Bible talks about over and over and over again through the New Testament about the fight that we are in. There are a lot of analogies that Paul uses when he was writing his epistles to the different churches that were spread throughout the region about fighting, about warfare. He, he used Roman soldiers. He used their armament to give a word picture of what we are doing in the spirit. We are fighting, you guys. This is a fight that we are in. If you think for one minute that you're going to become a Christian and that you're going to be able to sit back and that life's just going to be smooth sailing, you have a wrong idea of what the Christian walk is all about. The day you surrender your life to Jesus is the day that war truly begins. There's a battle over your soul from the time that you're born. No doubt about it. But when the enemy has you in his clutches and you have not surrendered to God and in all for all intents and purposes, you are resisting him and you're not even giving an inkling that you're about to yield to Jesus. He doesn't have to fight for you very much because he already has you. He spends his focus and his attention on those who are already submitted to Christ who are doing damage to his kingdom. And that's where the warfare amps up. However, the Bible tells us that the gates of hell do not prevail against Christians. And I want to take you guys back in time. I believe it was 2004. Whenever I was driving down here at the time, we did a, we did a series on a Tuesday morning. Who, who was around back then that remembers coming to that? Any of you guys in here back then? Not sure. A lot of new faces since that time. But we, me and the kids were driving down here on Tuesday mornings and we had a Bible study. This was over in the old church. So I think it was 2004. We moved in here in 2007, right? And so we were driving down there to the little old building, the little old church, and we did a whole series called Storm the Gates. We had on our battle fatigue and everything, and we were walking you through spiritual warfare and the fight that is over your soul. You can't get saved and then just sit there and just go on about your merry way. It becomes a fight at that moment. In that series, we learned that the gates of hell do not prevail. We learned that gates are stationary. Gates don't move. All right, think about your home. If you have a gate around your property, or maybe you live in a gated community, gates around castles and all of this, gates don't move. 
So when the Bible tells us that the gates of hell will never prevail against the church, that is a picture of a church that is marching forward as the army of God, taking back everything that the enemy has stolen. And we have a promise from heaven that when we engage in that type of battle, in that type of warfare, that there is no way that the gates that surround the kingdom of hell will ever stand and prevail against our forward attack. That is an amazing promise from the Father. So today we're talking about fighting for your life. How bad do you want to make sure that not only your life, but the life of your children and the life of your grandchildren and so on and so forth, all the way through the generations, make it to heaven. We all want to make sure that that happens. So we have to fight. We have to fight. Over the last couple of weeks, Dad has looked with you guys at defeating the pride of life. He's looked at you with you at defeating the lust of the eyes. And today, we are going to talk about the lust of the flesh that we just read about. Automatically, whenever I say that phrase, probably, I would say at least probably 80% of you in here and those watching on the line, online, whenever I say the lust of the flesh, our minds tend to gravitate towards that of a sexual nature. And we are going to look at that today. But as we delve into these scriptures, I want to remind you that the lust of the flesh is not only just about sexual issues in our life. Let's look at what a few of these words mean. So that as we read through some of these scriptures, you can put yourself in the place of, of any, wherever you find yourself struggling the most today. When we read through those scriptures, first of all, we're going to see the word world mentioned a lot. Okay, world. What about it? We can't love the world and love God. So what is this thing called the world? The world is simply anything in existence that opposes God. Period. Period. Anything in this life that opposes God. And let me just stop by saying, it can also be good things that aren't necessarily sin issues. But whenever the good things become outbalanced in your life and you begin to love those things even more than God, that to you has become part of the world. We also see the word lust. We're talking about the lust of the flesh today. Lust simply means desire. Intense, strong desire. The original Greek word that is used in this passage. Intense, strong desire. And again, that could be for good or for bad. We see scriptures where Jesus lusted after fellowship with us. Where he lusted to have relationship with us. Because lust in and of itself is not bad. It just depends on what you are desiring. All right? So we're talking about a bad kind of lust today, the lust of the flesh. But you need to keep in mind that it is a strong, intense desire. The lust of the flesh in this context today, the flesh is simply your body. We're talking about a very physical thing today. Okay, I know this sometimes in scriptures when we talk about the flesh, overcoming the flesh. We're talking about in a spiritual sense. Today, the word that is used in this passage in 1 John literally is a physical desire. All right? So we're, we're going physical today. We're going physical today. The lust of the flesh or things that our body crave can be very good things for us. Okay? Let's, let's talk about working out. Bub, I can use you for an example in this one because Bub is constantly working out. You guys know that he is an athlete. Speaking of that, he found out yesterday he is going to get to join the Buffalo family right here in Lady Lake. So come the 1st of April, I believe it's April 18th, somewhere in there, he will be moving down here with his grandparents. And he will be joining the Buffalo family. So we're extremely proud of that. But he is an athlete who is working out constantly. He is training. He's building those muscles. When you do that and when you work out and you spend that in intense time, whether it's cycling, whether it's jogging or whatever, there was once a time in my life, whatever, that was a strong desire. You guys can see that's not much of a desire anymore. <laughs> but it releases something in your body called endorphins. And those endorphins can give you almost a euphoric feeling. It's, it's a high, in a sense, 
that you're just riding on a cloud. You know, you can you can talk with an athlete after they get done, but walk in the door after being at the gym or after being outside in the yard, kicking that ball around, and you can just see like he's happy, he's excited. There's a joy that's in him because those endorphins are running wild, and is an excitement. You can become addicted to that kind of feeling, and it can drive you to desire it even more. Nothing wrong with desiring to be in, in top physical condition. It is just one of those things in the body that can happen. So you can begin to have a lust in the flesh for something more of that. If it begins to be out of balance where you're working out 23 out of 24 hours a day, now we have a problem, right? You probably would kill over in a couple of weeks. Also, when we're talking about the physical, the flesh, the literal flesh, our physical body, we can even talk about things such as food. Now we're talking a little more my life. We've got the athlete and the non-athlete. I get my workout from my fork coming from my plate to my mouth. <laughs> However, that's a bad thing. That's a really bad thing. And even through going back over these notes this week, man, the Lord has been hitting me hard. Take care of that temple. Take care of that temple. He's given it to me for a purpose. And I should be taking a lot better care of it. But we can develop such an appetite and such a craving for things that satisfy the flesh. The physical body. And that can quickly lead us into an area of imbalance. Now, when we're talking about the flesh, the flesh and the desiring of the food, if we're looking at a plate of strawberries or melons or whatever fruit it is that you like or the good scrumptious veggies, there is nothing wrong <clears throat> with having a strong desire or a lust for that kind of stuff that nurtures the body. It is when it becomes out of balance and when we are doing it in an indulgent way that is going to harm our bodies that now we have stepped over into the lust of the flesh. Are we, are we all trekking here today? A desire can be good or bad. It can be healthy or it can be wrong. And it depends on what we allow to happen. We are going to talk today specifically about sexuality because it is the number one thing that does grab hold of people when we are talking about the lust of the flesh. The enemy works over time in this particular area. If you don't believe me, just turn on your TV for a moment and let it run through one cycle of commercials. You can't even watch through commercials on your television set that some scantily clad woman, it used to be, then they started moving into the area of taking world-class athletes who were men and dressing them in their boxers and their brief to advertise underwear because they know sex sells. Whenever you look for toothpaste, the prettiest girl on the block is the one who is advertising the toothpaste. They make it as alluring and as sensual as possible. One of the reasons, and this, this is documented fact, one of the reasons that the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders have dressed the way that they have dressed throughout the ages is because the owners of the team knew they could sell more tickets and get more men in the stadium when they knew that what was standing in front of them was basically soft core porn. Do I need to say that one again? <laughs> Sex sells. Unfortunately, sex sells. And it has gotten us to a point in our community. Those of you who follow me on Facebook saw I posted again night before last. Another arrest has, or another sting has happened in Arizona. 37 more people, some of them very high profile people, were just arrested over the weekend in a child sex trafficking ring. Sex is a powerful thing. It is a very powerful thing, and the enemy knows that. Now, I'm going to tell you a little bit why sex is powerful, what the enemy knows about it, and why he uses it before we jump into the passage that Dad wanted you guys to hear today. Whenever God created Adam and Eve, and he set them in the garden, and he told them to be fruitful and multiply, there was nothing in that moment at all. That was provocative or even sensual. There was nothing dirty about sexuality. I wrote a blog one time. Many of you guys will remember it because actually Facebook flagged me for the title. The title of it was called Erotica in Eden because it didn't exist. 
Matter of fact, until they ate of the fruit, neither of them even recognized they were naked. It was after they ate the fruit that their eyes were open and they began to cover up. Before that moment, there was no shame in the human body. It was absolute, complete enjoyment that God created as a gift for husband and wife. It is such a powerful pull that it is pretty much the glue that holds a relationship together in a lot of senses. And those of you who have been through, through mine and Steve's marriage classes understand that quite well. We've explained that in a lot of detail, so we will not belabor that today. But it is a strong urge that has a man especially desiring his wife. If you are a man in this place, whenever I talk about sexuality and I talk about you being intimate with your wife, and yes, we are a church that believes it is man and wife. So whenever you are pulled in and desiring of your wife, it can be the most intense bond for you. You will feel connected to her emotionally, mentally, sometimes spiritually. Whenever you have been able to connect with her physically. It does hold that power for a woman, but not quite to the same degree because we are more emotional. And we connect with our spouses when our emotional needs are being met. When a woman's emotional needs are being met, she more freely gives of her body. And when a man's physical needs are being met, he will more freely give of his emotions. It is a glue that God created between a man and a woman to create that desire that pulls you together and that connects you in a spousal relationship. The Bible gives us many examples throughout the word of whenever a man and a woman come together, all of the attributes of God can be seen. Everything that is innately masculine, for lack of a better word, he has instilled in men. And I don't care how many operations you have. I don't care how you identify on any given day. Innately, what God has created in that male chromosome is what you are going to have. Surgery will never take it away. Instead, it's going to leave you depressed. It's going to leave you bewildered. And it's going to leave you in a moment of contemplating taking your own life and existence. Because what you thought would change can never change. God put it in you as a picture of who he is. And it is the same way with the women. We can go through different names of God that for lack of a better way to say it, the more feminine qualities, the nurturer, the carer, the caregiver, the one who listens and who is emotional and loving, all of that he put into the woman. So that when a man and a woman come together, the Bible tells us they are a complete picture of God. Matter of fact, it says that it creates godly offspring when it is operating correctly now satan knows that he knows that he knows the glue he knows the power he knows what it is going to do in the life of a man and a woman whenever it is operating correctly so he has set out to profane it and to make it as dirty as lustful as meaningless as possible and the thing about it is that when we operate and when we allow that lust of the flesh and the physical desire in our sexuality to overtake us in an unhealthy way, there is never enough of it. That is the way that the flesh works. Now I'm using flesh in the sense of spirituality, okay? The flesh, the desires of anything that is opposing God. No matter what the sin may be. When you step out in that thing, a little is never enough. There is an old saying that goes around that sin takes you further than you ever wanted to go. It keeps you longer than you ever wanted to stay. And it costs you way more than you were ever willing to pay. Because it's never enough. The enemy is going to make sure of that. It's never enough. The way that our physical body is, you can think back to that moment if you're married in here. You can think back to that moment when you and your spouse were together for that first, first time. And the encounter that happened and 
and just that moment of being together completely given to each other in a very godly way, in a godly union, how you craved for more. Now, in a natural sense, the way that God created it in the confines of a godly home and a godly marriage, that is a good thing. But it is whenever our lusts and our desires for that begins to overtake us to where it becomes unhealthy, now we have problems. Do you know that 70% of men in church, okay, I'm talking about church men. Now, the way that this is defined, okay, I'm not talking about people that come once a month or people that come on Christmas and Easter. I'm talking about men who attend a service at least two times a month regularly and faithfully. 70% of those men have sexual addictions in their life. Some of those addictions, maybe they haven't even acted out yet against their spouse. Maybe they are requiring their spouse to do things that are uncomfortable. Maybe they are putting a pressure on their spouse and they try to justify it in their minds, but I haven't cheated on my, on my wife. But it is unhealthy and unnatural lust, an, an unnatural desire that has developed that is pushing them to the brink of acting out. However, in this sense, 70% of godly men who attend church at least twice a month are acting out through avenues of pornography, self-activities, and I think you guys can know what that means without me having to, to go deeper into that word, and outright adulterous affairs on their spouses. Turn with me to Proverbs ch chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1, and Dad wanted us to work all the way through this chapter today. We will try to do that quickly. But it is a chapter that talks about the danger of lust. Now here's what I want to tell you. It's just like with anything else, okay? You can have a desire in your life to do something. Maybe you have a desire to go ride a roller coaster. <laughs> Not me. My Bible says, lo, I am with you always. Lo, I am with you always. <laughs> so I don't get on those big tall roller coasters for those of you that just <laughs> but maybe you have that desire today you want to go out there and you want to jump to the next theme park and go ride a roller coaster nothing wrong with that it's just a little desire All right, it's just something fun that you want to do you're going to jump in your car and go do it when that desire takes you a little further then now you have to attach a little rubber band around your ankle and start jumping off of things like the Empire State Building, defying gravity and defying life itself, <laughs> we, we may have developed into something a little more dangerous. There is a progression that can happen whenever it comes to lust. All right, Proverbs 7, verse 1. Sounds like you guys are there, so let's get started. My son, keep my words and treasure my commands within you. Keep my commands and live, and my law as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers, write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you are my sister, and call understanding your nearest kin, that they may keep you from the immoral woman, from the seductress who flatters with her words. Now we're going to read here today about a very real incident with a woman. This, this incident was actually captured out the window by King Solomon. He watched this incident happen. It happened in front of the king. So let me go ahead and insert this here. Beware your sins will find you out. Because there is nothing ever truly secret. Solomon the king observed this going on. And he decided to write about it. Some words of wisdom to watch us. But we need to keep in mind that it is actually a spirit that we're dealing with in some instances, okay? The first time that you have sex outside of the confines of marriage, fornication is sex outside of marriage if you're not married. We've got two singles who see each other, one thing leads to another, and then there you have it. That's fornication. Adultery is whenever you are married or the person that you are engaging is married, and you guys have relations together. Now you've committed adultery. Both are equally wrong in the sight of God. So don't sit there and think that I'm single. It's okay. I'm not married. I'm not committing adultery. No, you're just con committing fornication. And it's equally wrong. 
The very first time that you do that, outside of the confines of marriage, you have just opened the door for a spirit to attack you, a spirit of lust. We're going to read about that in Proverbs chapter 1, or chapter 7. I want you to think about that. It's the same thing with anything that we do outside of the, the bounds of God, whether it's alcohol, whether it's drugs. Anything that we take the first time opens the door. Dad's been talking to us all month long about opening doors, opening doors, inviting trouble. The very first time we engage in that kind of activity, we are inviting trouble. Does that mean that the first time that you do something like that, that this spirit's going to jump on you and, and now take residence in your soul? Because remember, he's taught us through this series that Christians can have devils. They cannot live in our spirit. We're not demon-possessed, but we are demon-oppressed, and we are demon-harassed when we open the door in our soul realm, which is the seat of our mind, will, and emotions, to where we just can't break through and get victory over things because we have allowed an enemy to come in and set up a throne in our soul. We want to be very careful about that. And we want to be very careful about keeping doors closed. It is not worth it. When we think about it in that context, and if I step out and do this, I'm opening a door and just inviting the enemy on in. Trust me, all you have to do is give it a little crack because the enemy is not a gentleman. He's just going to push it and barge his way on into your life. You can do it once, repent before God and, and move on and no spirit comes in. But why would you take a chance? The reason why I know that this is a super powerful thing is because in the occult world, do you know the way that they initiate new cult members in? It is through gang rapes that happen by the high priest or priestess, priestesses of an occult coven. It always involves a sex act of some kind. Dr. Terry Weir calls it an STD. It is a sexually transmitted demon. It is the number one way that demons can have access to our life. The occult knows that quite well. Now, I'm not asking you to step out and study into the occult because it's actually very dangerous if God has not called you to do it. There have been many spirit-filled men and women of God who set out to expose the occult who got sucked into it because it's a powerful world. And if God hasn't called you to that, don't do it. Don't, don't even attempt to do it. But their rituals, aside from bloodletting, which happens in these sexual encounters, always involves a sexual encounter. Because they understand sometimes better than we do in the church. Do you know that the, that the enemy knows every word of the Bible? The Bible says that the demons fear and tremble. The demons know the word. When Jesus came out and the demoniac came running out of the cave, what did the demons speak through him? What are you doing here, you son of God? It is not your time yet. Even they knew the word. And I'm here to tell you. If you want to succeed in your Christian life in this fight for your life, if you want to fight to maintain control of your own salvation and the salvation of future generations in your lineage, you better learn the word because the devil knows the word. When Jesus was taken out into the wilderness for his 40 day temptation, what was it that Satan used at him? The word. How did Jesus overcome him during the 40 days of temptation? The word. Satan knows enough of this Bible that he can take one verse or he can take half a verse and he can twist it around just like we saw him do with Eve. He twisted the statement just a little bit, caused her believe, to believe just a little bit different than really how it was conveyed. And off into bondage they went. And here in bondage we still are in twenty. 21. You have got to know your word because the enemy knows the word. The occult knows enough of the practices that have power to be able to pervert them and to harness the power in an evil way. And it is time that the church understands those things to take back that power. We had a young girl and I hadn't anticipated sharing this. 
But we had a girl that had come to our church when Steve and I were attending a different church. And deliverance was part of what we did there. And she came in and partway through the worship services, you know, she, you can see those devils start to manifest. You know when somebody's got devils. Come to find out this girl was in a coven. She was actually the priestess of the coven. She was the one who the people in the coven would actually drink of her blood at these initiation services. That's how high up she was. And when we sat down to talk to her and to carry her through deliverance and, and to bring her to a relationship with Jesus and to get her out of that, because thank God, he, Jesus, no other name is more powerful, right? There is no rival. There is no rival. I asked her, and we got to talking, and I said, what was the Lord? What was the Lord? Her answer to me was power. Power. She said, I, she worked at a bank. She worked in the drive-thru of the bank. And powerful men in the community who were involved in churches, pastors, deacons, would come through her drive-thru to bring their deposits and I guess people don't think you can see in their cars from those drive through windows. I used to work the drive through at the bank, so I know quite well you can see very well <laughs> inside a car. All the way to the floorboard, so don't think you're hiding it. And she said, I knew these men to be pastors in our community, and I knew them to be deacons at their churches. And she said, they would come through the drive through with pornography on their car seats, spread wide open to the centerfold. And that's what I would have to look at as I was counting in their deposits. And she said, I began to think to myself that if Christian people don't even have a God that is powerful enough to hold them in purity to where they are not doing things contrary to the word, why would I ever want their God? So I started to seek power in the dark side. And trust me, she found it. She could throw hexes. She could throw spells. She could do anything that she wanted to do in confines of the satanic occult. And there was a power that was there. First of all, the power of fear is so great that most of those people can't break away because they're afraid of what's going to happen to them when they do break away. And they are more allegiant, more sold out, and more dedicated to a profane, evil occult than what most of us are committed to the truth. And that's sad. It wasn't too long after that we had another lady had come to our church, a similar situation. She was not actually in an occult, but she was into witchcraft really strong. And it was the same story. We hear that over and over. When Steve and I do our youth ministry and we talk to youth who, who test the waters a little bit. Bub had a really good friend a couple of years ago that he was bringing into the home a lot. And we got to talking about him. And come to find out this kid at 14 years old had done a, satan a satanic ceremony in his own bedroom to try to sell his soul to Satan because life was so out of control. His grandparents were Christians. He lived in their home. But there wasn't a, a view of Christ in the home. There was some suffering and some abusive things that had happened within other family relationships. And what he saw wasn't lining up with what he heard about the power in the occult. It's time we do better. We are in the fight for our life. We are struggling to live free indeed. And we have got to know that there is more to this life than what we have accustomed to doing by giving God a 45 minute nod on Sunday mornings. Back to Proverbs chapter 1. Bind my commandments in your heart that they may keep you from the immoral woman. We're picking up at verse 16. For at the window of my house I looked through my lattice and saw among the simple. I perceived among the youths a young man devoid of understanding. Okay, this is King Solomon. He's watching out the window, and he's about to see it go down. Passing along the street near her corner, and he took the path to her house in the twilight, in the evening, in the black, and in the dark of night. This young man thought he was going in unseen and hidden. I don't care what kind of secrecy you think that you were doing these things in. Meeting a woman or a man outside of your marriage at a remote locations. I counseled a woman one time who drove all the way to another city. Would tell her husband she was going for training for work and she would meet 
meet this man in another city. Doesn't matter how secret you think it is. The king is watching. The king. The king is watching. Verse 10. And there a woman met him with the attire of a harlot and a crafty heart. One of the first signs that lust has grabbed hold of a person is the way they will dress, men and women. When the shirts all of a sudden come buttoned down halfway to the navel on a man or a woman, that is a huge sign that a spirit of lust has already taken hold. When a woman's attire is all about her physique and her body, I worked hard for this body. You don't have a right to show it off. Because you are not your own. You were bought with a price. I don't care how hard you work out. I don't care how many endorphins you have spinning. I don't care how many hours you spend running track. You do not have a right to show off your body because it is not your own. You were bought with a price, the blood of Jesus. You belong to him. And when you dress in attire, the attire of a harlot, I want you to understand that King Solomon was telling us that the way that we dress, the way that we approach life with, with bringing attention to our body, to our attributes, men or women. There are some men who wear pants tighter than women do. There are some guys who button their shirt so far and I'm like, dude, that, that chest hair does not look good. Cover it up. <laughs> The more clothes that a girl begins to take off, I'm going to tell you this from personal experience. I can remember as I was getting closer to Jesus, and as he was really taking me through what we call the river, and I was stepping in deeper and deeper and deeper, he would tell me, if I would put on a, an outfit that was a little bit too form-fitting and not saying that I would still get it all perfectly well, right now I wear tents because I've, I've expanded my pegs a little he would tell me. He would say, go, go change that. So I would ask Steve. I'd say, Steve, do you think this is provocative anyway? And of course, Steve's a man. He's like, no, that looks good. I'm like, okay, I really better go change it now. <laughs> and as I was getting closer to God, one of the things that I noticed is he would make me cover up. You know, even if I didn't have on a really low-cut shirt, I'd go to bend over a pew, and it's just like the Holy Ghost would just, you just knew. You just know. When the man of God and Reed came running out at Jesus from the tombs, the Bible says he was naked. The chains couldn't hold him. When Jesus delivered him, what does the Bible tell us in the next scene? It says, here he came back clothed and in his right mind. The more a spirit of lust has a grip on you, it is going to be seen even in the outward appearance. And I'm telling you that from personal experience. The closer you get to Jesus, the more modest you will naturally become. So mamas, daddies, grandmas, granddaddies, when you start seeing this in your grandkids, when you start seeing this in your children, that's the time you better nip it. Nip it in the bud. Confront that demon head on. Because the life of that child is hanging in the balance. And that spirit of lust can grab hold of that girl or boy. And that spirit of lust can get his clutches in so deep that they become the town harlot. To put it in today's vernacular for all the teenagers who may be watching today, they become the town hope. Stop it before the enemy takes them too far. Stop it. It's your job. It is your responsibility. To stop it. There a woman met him with the attire of a harlot and a crafty heart. She was loud and rebellious. Her feet would not stay at home. At times she was outside and at times in the open square. She was lurking on every corner. That spirit is constantly lurking for whom it can just attract and draw in. It's loud. It's a boisterous spirit. It's calling out to you because lust is so powerful and so strong. She caught him and she kissed him with an imputed face. She said to him, I have peace offerings with me and today I paid my vows. She can come across so religious and so spiritual. God would understand. We love each other. We're engaged. We're going to be married anyway. There have even 
have been people that have come into the counseling room living in a fornicated relationship, unmarried, but living together outside of the bonds of marriage, who have literally said, we pray together before we have sex, and God's told us that it's okay because he knows our deep love for each other. It's not Jehovah you're listening to. It's the God of this world you're listening to. But it is so cunning and so crafty. It can justify anything. So I came out to meet you diligently to seek your face. And here I have found you. I have spread my bed with tapestry. I've colored the coverings with Egyptian linen. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, with aloes, and with cinnamon. Come and let us take our fill of love until the morning. Lust is always alluring. Those pornographic images on your phone, on your computer, you don't, you don't even have to go buy magazines anymore. You can pull it up with one click of a phone. It is so alluring. The girls seem so beautiful, and there are women addicted to pornography too, but not near as many as men. It looks so enticing, so inviting. It's so beautiful. She says to him, come and let us take our fill of love until morning. Love, lust will always, always masquerade itself as love. But make no mistake about it. It is not love. Love is whenever you get married and you are committed in a relationship. And whenever babies are up puking all night. And that husband is up with you, helping you. Or whenever you are sick and you're puking your guts out over a commode. And your husband comes and holds the hair out of your face. To help nurture you any way he can. Now we're talking love. Luring somebody in because of a sexual act is not love. But lust will always, always masquerade. And here is the deal. You know those endorphins that we talked about with exercise? They're the same endorphins that are put off in your body in the moment of passion. That is one of the things that makes sex addicting. Because you have those endorphins, that feeling of a euphoric moment. They are the same hormones that are displaced in your body when you are looking at pornography. It causes a man or a woman to become attached to an image on a page. And it perverts sexuality in your life. It is alluring. And it gives you a feeling of satisfaction when you're done. But it is not love. And it leaves heartache in its wake. And trust me, I don't care how secret you try to keep it. The Bible says that God will work with you for a while. He will deal with you through your own convictions. But when you do not yield to the convicting voice of the Holy Spirit, He has no recourse left but to shout it from the rooftops. God will expose you because He loves you. Let us delight ourselves with love, lust says. You think stepping out with that woman at work is going to offer you love because your wife has turned into a griping old thing at home? The same girl that I was telling you about that I counseled with that would drive to the next town to have an adulterous affair on her husband started it off because men would come to work and just tell her, wow, you look pretty today. You look nice today. Guys, you want to safeguard your wives? From even laying prey to a compliment from another man, you better compliment her. Ladies, you want to protect your guys from falling prey to the soft-spoken word of a woman around the water cooler? You better compliment that man. For my husband is not at home, she says. He has gone on a long journey. He has taken a bag of money with him and he will come home on the appointed day. We won't get caught. Come on, there's nobody here to see us. But the king was watching through the window. With her enticing speech, she caused him to yield. With her flattering lips, she seduced him. Immediately he went after her as an ox goes to the slaughter or as a fool to the correction of the stocks. Till an arrow struck his liver as a bird hastens to the snare. He did not know that it would cost his life. Sin takes you further than you wanted to go, and it always costs you more than you wanted to pay. 
It will lead to spiritual death without sincere, true repentance before a Heavenly Father. But it can lead to a lot more death than that. The loss of a family. The loss of relationship with your children. Some people have lost jobs over this. Some people have lost political positions over this. It doesn't matter who you are and what job you have. Death is always the end result. Now therefore, listen to me, my children. We're on verse 24. Pay attention to the words of my mouth. Do not let your heart turn aside to her ways. We're talking about a spirit of lust. Don't stray down her paths. You have a choice. Don't do it. For she has cast down many wounded, and all who were slain by her were strong men. Over the last two months since the election, we have heard of two very prominent men in the kingdom. If I said their names today, you guys would know them right away. But I will not bring more shame to their families by saying that out loud. But if you've been paying attention to the news, you know who I'm speaking of. Two very prominent men within the kingdom. These are strong men. Strong men, it says. Who have been lured away. Who have been enraptured and encaptured by the spirit of lust because it is strong. He says, stay away. Don't even turn towards the past. Because in the end, it will bring you death. Verse 27, her house is the way to hell. Descending to the chambers of death. You are in a fight for your life. You're in a fight of your life. The lust of the flesh is a big one. I've mentioned several areas today where the lust of the flesh can grab a hold of you. All of us. And I don't think there's any of us in here that are not guilty at least to some degree. I've already told you the lust of the flesh and this food thing has been a thorn in my side. Sexuality may not be your issue, but it could be something else that is gratifying your physical body. That you just got to have more, and you just got to have more, and you just got to have more. And you have stepped out into avenues that you've been caught, and it doesn't matter. Because it is so strong, you got to have it just one more time. And I'm here to let you know today, if getting caught and facing the disappointment of your family... The possible dis dissolvement of your marriage. The possible disconnect from your children. If that is not enough, then you better think about the loss of your soul for all eternity. Because the end result of this game is always death. When God says don't do it, don't put your hand on it, don't touch it, and we touch it anyway, I don't care how many times we come to church. The Bible says that there will be many who stand before him that says, Lord, Lord, didn't we? Didn't we prophesy in your name? And here, I love that he included this one. Didn't we even cast out devils in your name? I love that he included that for us Pentecostals. Because for Pentecostals, we seem to think that the climax of the Christian faith and the ultimate power in the pulpit is if we can cast the devil out of somebody. That's like the pinnacle. The end all, end all. And let me tell you something. The Bible says, didn't we even cast out devils in your name? And he is still going to look and say, depart from me. Because I didn't know you. He loves the sinner enough to work through you, to work through your gifts, and to work through your talents because he loves the sinner. But make no mistake, what God does in and through you, in and through your prayer, in and through your ministry is no indication that you are really right with God. What indicates that you are really right with God is obeying his word. And if you are stepping out in this area, it is time to get it right. Go ahead and slip to the, to the uh, stage, please. We are in the fight of our life. It is the pride of life. It is the lust of the eyes, wanting everything we see. And it is the lust of the flesh. Those are the three big things that God talked about, the three. Because all other sin lies right there within those three. Everything, if we, if we went through all the sin that is listed in Scripture, we could find one of these three to categorize them in. And the lust of the flesh is 
To me, the strongest, and I believe that is why he listed it first in that verse. He listed it first because it is the most powerful. It is the strongest. It is the most gratifying. So what do we do? What do we do? Dina, what do I do? Yeah, I've, I've had this addiction and I just can't seem to conquer it. Could it be that you are now wrestling with a spirit of lust? Could it now be that it has gone farther than just your flesh and your desires? That maybe you acting out on those desires has opened the door for a demon, for a spirit of lust to come on in and to take residence in your life. And I'm telling you, if that's the case, it doesn't matter how much you try to not do it again. It is going to take the delivering power of Jehovah God to break that spirit off of your life. And then you have to be faithful to close every door. I love the scene in the movie Fireproof where when he was dealing with this issue, he was so determined that he was going to get it right that he took his computer outside and he started bashing the computer, breaking it. If you got to throw your phone away, throw it away. You don't need it anyway. How bad do you want to be free? How bad do you want to be free? What links are you willing to go to to make sure that every door in your life is closed? If that means quitting your job and working somewhere else, maybe you're going to have to do it. Because maybe that spirit of lust is working so strongly where you work that it is affecting you. Because you can be polluted and affected by the devils who come in your presence. When I mentioned that kid, there was a friend of Bub's when he was coming into our home. And we had him coming into our home to minister to him. We were trying to get him saved. And we love the kid. He's a precious kid. Sweet spirit about him. But when he started coming around, we would have dreams. And I would have dreams. And I knew, okay, there, there's something spiritual in the atmosphere. I didn't know exactly what was going on. But, but they were dreams not of a sexual context. Just dreams that I knew God was speaking to me. Things are, things are happening in the atmosphere. So I went and I talked to the kids and I said, you guys feel like y'all are having like any kind of struggles at all? And Kristen said, well, you know, mom, it's so weird. I've never been a jealous person, but all of a sudden I'm just starting to feel like I'm jealous of, of everything. And I went and I talked to Bub and I says, Bub, do you feel like you've been struggling with anything at all? And, and he said, you know, he, he felt like maybe pride was, was a thing that was trying to get a hold of him. And, and I said, that we got to stop this. People that you are around and that you allow into your atmosphere connect with you and create soul ties. And it could very well be that you have allowed somebody into your life that carries this spirit of lust. That it is on them that somehow, whether through molestation, through their own promiscuous acts, whatever the deal is, that they have opened the door for this spirit to move in their life and to take hold and since they've been around you you've noticed your thought patterns have started to change i can remember going to step out of my shower one morning and just out of the blue because one of the things that has always irritated me the most with people is this right here when they're married i have said it probably a million times you can ask my husband out of all the things that people can do to their spouse Adultery is one that I just don't have tolerance for. Because you don't just fall into it. You have to lie. You have to sneak around. You have to meet up. You have to physically get your clothes off. There are so many steps you have to take that you don't just, Oop, I fell into this. No, you didn't. It took a lot of effort to meet up. It took a lot of thought. And it's always just been one of those things that I've had the least amount of tolerance for. And when this kid was, was hanging around... I went to step out of the shower one day and just out of the blue, out of the blue, I, I can honestly say to you, if Jesus were standing here because he is, I would look Jesus in the face and I would say the same thing I'm saying to you. Never in our marriage up to that point, and that we had been married about 30 years at that point, never in 30 years had I ever, ever thought of cheating on my husband, ever. It's just one of those issues that I just, I have no tolerance for it. I'm not going to tolerate it in my life. Certainly not going to tolerate it in his. And I went to step out of the shower that morning and just out of the blue, the thought hit me. Not of any particular person. But I thought, I could.
could go cheat on Steve today and I wouldn't have any problem doing it. And I just kind of shook my head. You know how you, you just kind of shake yourself into reality? And I went, whoa, Lord, where in the world did that thought come from? Fortunately, I try my best to keep myself immersed in God's presence and immersed in his word that I saw it immediately, immediately, like before my second foot hit the little bath mat. I realized what the enemy was trying to do in my head, that he was trying to get inside my mind. All because we had the wrong influences that were coming into our home. It was for a right reason. We thought we were going to get this kid saved. And he did open up and he talked to us about a lot of things. He counseled with me and Steve and, and we got pretty deep into his life, but he never yielded to the Lord. I don't care how strong you are. I don't care how right your motives are. When we are dealing with spirits and demons from hell, they are powerful. They are strong. And if you are not watchful, they will take you down. I still love this kid. If this kid wanted to meet up with me, I would drive to meet him. I would still do my best to get him into the kingdom. But he doesn't come to our home anymore. Some of you are going to have to cut some ties and some relationships. Because you're staying connected to people that is causing the spiritual atmosphere around you to try to get its grips in you. And as hard as it may have to be, I'm not telling you to leave a spouse, okay? There's counseling for that. And we can help you work that out with a spouse. But other relationships may have to go. You may have to change a job if you're working at a job where that's like what people do. They talk about it. They bring it to work. They cheat on their spouses. You may need a different job. How serious are you? Stand with me. How serious are you? Because this is a fight for your life. This is a fight for your life. Do you know that if you step out and you engage in this, if you bring that pornography into your home, you are opening the atmosphere in your home to harass your children. You are bringing that atmosphere into your home to harass your grandchildren. Do you know that you can have the second, third, fourth generation into bondage because granddaddy was in bondage? You can have the third, fourth, fifth generation into bondage because grandma was in bondage. How serious are you? And for some of you, it is simply a matter of discipline. Once you gain deliverance from a spirit of lust, and maybe it hadn't even gone that far for you yet. Maybe you just dabbled a couple of times, whether it was pornography, adultery, fornication, you know, self-behaviors. Maybe it's only been a couple times, and a spirit hasn't really grabbed clutch on you yet. It's just a matter of discipline in all of our lives. The book of Galatians tells us that one of the, the evidence of the fruit, there's only one fruit, one of the evidence of the fruit is self-control. When you feel that urge, when you feel that temptation, it is up to you to control yourself. Push away from the table. Sit down the Cadbury egg. Go to the gym one hour instead of five. Shut off the phone if you're tempted to look at things you shouldn't. Self-control. Discipline. Our whole life as believers is about discipline. I am disciplined in a lot of areas, but obviously one. And I happen to carry my sin outward. People see it. Some of you are carrying this sin. We can't necessarily see it, but it won't be long. We'll see the effect of it. I can promise you that. Depression. Anger. Anxiety. Irritability. Dear God, we just come before your throne this morning. Now, I know that you guys can pray in your seat where you are, but we're, we're taking it a step further today. This is a fight for your life. This is a fight for 
through your life and you are trying to live free. Some of you need a full out deliverance from a spirit of lust that has had you bound since possibly you were a child. Maybe you were molested when you were a kid or were exposed to images that you never should have been. And you have wrestled with this lust your whole life. Maybe it is that you can never get satisfied. There's always got to be more and you're not happy if you're not acting out in some way. And it is driving you into behaviors that are repulsive to God. And trust me, it will always take you further. You may think right now it's just a look. You may think right now it's just a self-behavior. But trust me, it is going to take you further than you want it to go. Because the spirit of lust gets its grips on you. And it costs you way more than you ever thought you would pay. And if you really want to be set free from this thing, you need to get in this altar. Maybe it's not even a spirit of lust, but you just want God to help you with self-control. You need to get in this altar. I need to be in this altar with my food. The lust of the flesh that drives me to overeat. This doesn't have to just be a sexual thing. And let me tell you something. If you're sitting in this room today and you are too embarrassed to come down here to ask God to touch you, to ask God to help you be free, to ask God to help you be disciplined, and you are too embarrassed to live free. And I'm telling you, if you walk out of this place today, this is a word from God. I believe it in my heart. If you walk out of this place today and you don't get serious with God, it's going to ramp up to a new degree that you never thought would come. Because God is giving you the chance today. He is wanting you to make a radical step today. To be a warrior in the army, no matter how embarrassing it may be. Do you think it's easy for me to stand up here and talk to you about my food? I know there's going to be judgment coming. I know the next time that y'all happen to go out to eat with me, and y'all see me eating an ice cream at Culver's, y'all are going to be like, she just preached on that. But if I want to be free, I've got to get real with you, and you've got to get real with yourself. Want God to touch you in any of these areas today, I want you to come up front. God, I thank you that your delivering power is in this room. And God, you exhibited that to us at the very beginning. When your presence filled this place, God, when you arrested us in your presence, when you would not give us the freedom to move on because you wanted us to sit with you a while, that was the signal to me that God, you are in this place and you are ready to offer this deliverance today. I will not beg you to come because I'm not going to beg you to want freedom. If you want freedom deep down inside, then you would be running to these altars. There would be nothing that would hold you back. If you are in the fight of your life and you feel this thing gripping on you, or you feel that it's just started, maybe it's tapping you on the shoulder. Hello? Hello? Then you would be running to this altar to keep that door closed. five more seconds and then we're going to pray our benedictory prayer. Medina, can I do this in my seat? You can. But if you're that embarrassed that you've got to do that, then the pride of life has already grabbed so hold on you that you're already way further gone than you thought you were. God, I thank you so much that the power of your word has gone forward today. God, I thank you that you love us enough that you teach us in every area and every aspect of our life. God, I thank you that freedom is always there, ready for us when we just turn around and receive it. God, I pray for those who are watching online. If you're watching online and this has been you today. And you're saying, I wish I could run to that altar. I wish I could run to that altar. I am telling you, just get on your knees right where you are in your living room. Get on your knees in your bedroom. If you're driving down the road, pull over. Pull over on the side of the road and get with God in this moment. Because God is reaching out to you. God will meet you at the altar right there where you are. God is ready to deliver you. He is ready to set you free. He is ready to empower you with self-control and discipline to keep a spirit of lust out of your way. If that is you and you're watching online, God has touched you deeply and you don't know where to go.
go from here and you don't know what to do now, I want you to message us. Send us a message through Facebook. If you're watching my YouTube, then you can send me a message through YouTube. Those of you who are friends with me on Facebook, send a message. You can send us emails right here to the church. You can email me personally, and we will help you get connected to a spirit-filled church in your area. And we will help walk you through the next steps of what you need to do. God, I pray over every person that is in this place today. God, that this word would not fall on fallow ground. But God, instead, it is going to fall on soil that is ready to receive the seed of this word. And God, I pray that as they leave this place today, that these words will resonate within their heart. God, maybe they just need to share it with someone else whom they know is in bondage, that you will give them the power and the wisdom to know how to do that, God. Father, I pray that a blessing will overtake them such as they have never encountered before. And that this will be the most radical week of overwhelming blessing that they have ever encountered. And we will give you all the praise and all the glory.